I have a confession. I have no song. Uh, so hold disappointed. On. Oh. No, 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 hold on. <laughs> the day the music died. Uh. Bye, bye, this American pie. Drove, drove my Chevy, Chevy to, the... to the levee, but the levee was dry. Yes. Uh, you have <laughs> That's a Chevy? the day the music died. because I. Is didn't... it just a, it's a Chevy yeah. love? It, it's the, it's, it's a rebadged Suzu Pup, yeah. Yeah, to Chevy Love. To yesterday's, yeah. The, drove the Chevy Love to the levee, but the levee was dried. Mm. Um, so, welcome to another episode of the Car Mudgeon Show. My name is Jason Camisa, and that... Which side are you on? Over. I, I'm the, on the right side of the screen, generally. Yeah, but I don't know what way I'm looking at. Like, you know how, like, iPhones reverse it? The guy on one of those sides is Derek Tam hyphen Scott. Yes. And we're still in quarantine. Shocking. Um, but you launched a new video at the end of last week uh, about the Bugatti Veyron. I did. Uh, and I must say that for it being shot in an empty building with just you standing there, it was incredibly interesting. Thank uh, you. And I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, that means about a, lot. a car that is generally like not really my style of car for a number of reasons, which. I know is exactly how everybody reacts to that car, and that's why you sort of started the video the way you did with this sort of discussion of a pointless flex. <laughs> <laughs> so I like that you call it a discussion of a pointless flex. When I was like, what stunt could I possibly do to grab people's attention right away? Because I know what happens. People hear the word Veyron and they're like, the thing sucks. Like just whatever, it's stupid, it's too heavy, it's too this, whatever. And I thought, all right, everything has been said about the Veyron except the truth, which is I don't think people realize there are two of them. Like, they're two different cars. And yes, they, have, they share similar suspension geometry and they have the same basic engine, but it's a different tub. Like, mm -hmm. and, and everything from start to finish was different. So I thought this would be an opportunity. So we have in the office that, um, that Super Sport 300, which mm -hmm. is one of one. So it's the 300th and final coupe ever made. Correct. Um, and I thought we should, let's just talk about this, the fact that the Veyron is not a pointless flex. And actually, I stole some of the discussion from you. Was it you who used the term pointless flex? Mm, I think I probably said something else about it. That doesn't okay. sound like 95-year-old lingo to me. <laughs> no, that's right. So it was another friend of, of ours who's also like old. And he was like, oh, it's nothing but a pointless flex, as the kids say. But then you said something that I stole. You're the one that came up with the idea that, that going to the moon was a pointless... Well, oh, yes. you didn't say the pointless flex, right? Yes. It was a pointless exercise. Yeah, I dro so I drove that car and I wrote this article about it for our online magazine, which is called Escape on Wheels, and uh, which I don't, I mean, I've contributed to a couple of times, it's not my deal, uh, but I, I wrote the story about that car because it was, you know, he said, let's come up with something to say about this, uh, and I said, okay, I'm, uh, this is, uh, it's not really my style of car, like I would much prefer a small, old, naturally aspirated thing that Broken, well, I'll giggle, yeah. yeah, that I'll, will make me giggle at 38 miles an hour, and so... You know, what is in this car for me? And I, um, so I, I went in with a sort of negative, uh, I don't know, mindset about the car. Uh, and I will say that after experiencing it, I got it. And like I begrudgingly or carmudgingly, carmudgingly uh, found myself really enjoying it. Uh, and it's the type of enjoyment that you just, it's truly awesome. Like it feels like it's defying physics. Uh, and so that part of it was really like extraordinary. And just to be, you know, of course, I grew up in the era when the, that car came out and it was just like everyone who wasn't into cars. I mean, I guess the reason why I didn't like the car was because everyone who wasn't into cars got really excited about like right. the Veyron. It's the same thing now when people are like, you know, what do you think of Tesla? That's always what a non-car person find, says to me when they find out that I'm into cars. They're like, what do you think of Tesla? And I'm like... I mean, I'm glad it <laughs> exists. <what> I <laughs> I'm glad it exists, and it's like a, a a wonderful car, but it doesn't supply the things that I value in an automotive experience. So, like, I get that it's really cool and it's good at what it does, but it's not, you know, it doesn't align with my personal values. But that's like super subjective. That's super like my own perspective. Uh, and having experience of Aaron in person, like I, I do, I am in awe of it. I think it's impossible not to be in awe of what it what it is and what it can do. So interestingly, you use the term in awe. So I use that, that term in the video. I'm in awe of the, the thousand horsepower Veyron. So 
to recap for anyone who hasn't seen the video and you really should, you should that's your homework i you know instead of listening to me sing you should be watching that video it's a couple minutes long <clears throat> the original thousand and one horsepower veyron um, did 253 miles an hour, and and um, there were two variants of each it's of them. Technically, the a thousand and one PS, right? Yes. So here's the thing: it's a th- that's an interesting point. So it's a, the the goal was more than 1,000 horsepower, so they rated at 1,001, and that's metric horsepower PS or CV or whatever you know language you want to speak. Um, that translates to 987 US SAE horsepower. However, and all the magazines, including me, you know, like back in the day, we all wrote 987. But then the engineers told me that it made so far in excess of 1,001 that they're like, that's why we called it 1,001. Like, it's just more than 1,000, so it's 1,001. Mm-hmm. Um, r- realistically, though, actually, inside our baseball, if you watch the videos that I posted at the end of that video where I'm doing full throttle acceleration run, in the 1,001 horsepower car, it only gets up to 850 because that's all a Veyron can do on California 91 gas. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the twelve hundred horsepower cars, I think, can get to a thousand, and that's all. You're of course referring to the power gauge, which the, the power car gauge has, yes, uh, in like a Rolls Royce kind of. Um, the opposite. It's the opposite Rolls-Royce because the power Rolls-Royce reserve. Says reserve, and this card actually gives you a real time yeah. read of what the, a dyno would be reading on yeah, the car. Exactly. Um, so the the thousand horsepower cars, which, which looks were, suspiciously like a boost gauge, in terms of its, its behavior. And well, throttle. boost, it's, it's throttle, boost, and turbo. Uh, it's throttle, boost, and I'm sorry, and, and RPM. So, yes, but the behavior um, of the gauge resembles what a boost gauge does. Yeah. It's a kind of a cool gimmicky gauge. Um, mm-hmm. I like it. Um, but there, so there were 2,000 horsepower Veyrons. There was the, the basic EB16.4, which is the coupe, and then there was the convertible, which is called the Grand Sport. Um, then there were the 1,200 horsepower cars. And the 1,200 horsepower cars... Um, were completely re-engineered from top to bottom. They had a different tub, they had different suspension tuning, a different shock springs, bars, um, different, I mean, it was effectively a different car. And I love another thing. The original ones had a Burmester sound system, um, and the 1200 horsepower cars, I think Volkswagen Group had a falling out with Burmester. And so they, had, they have a new stereo system in the 1200 horsepower cars called Puccini which is a completely made up name. Like they just made up a name for a sound system. They're like, we'll just do a high-end sound system and call it Puccini. Yeah, that sounds operatic. Anyway, so everything down to the stereo system was new on, on these cars. And body panels were almost all new. And, um, and that 1200 horsepower car was also available in both a coupe and a convertible. Um, the coupe called, was called the Super Sport. I think there were only 30 of them. And then the, uh, the Grand Sport Vitesse which is the uh, convertible 1200 horsepower car. I remember doing some research when I wrote that article. I thought they made more of them. I thought they made a few, several like, of, of the, of the 1200 horsepower cars. There are differing numbers. Um, but what I found is that, <clears throat> first of all, we know there are 450 Veyrons total. There are 300 coupes and 150 convertibles. Um, there are 30, 30, if I remember correctly, super sports, and then eight, um, eight of them for the US market. However, then there were a ton of special editions like the Pierre Veyron edition, the oh, black edition, oh, whatever, I see, I that see. were based on the 1200 horsepower But they're all 1200 horsepower cars. Yeah. Got it. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but I think actual like US spec super sport standard was like Standard super yeah. sport <clears throat> standard. And what that was, Bugatti was amazing. I mean, Piège was like so incredibly smart. Like I make fun of him and I call him, you know, like I insinuate that he was a murderous, homicidal, <laughs> or German, which is... <laughs> Kind of not, it was kind of mean, but, um, but the reality is they were genius. They started out a million euro for this car and everyone laughed. Like there's no way they're going to sell 450 cars at a million a piece. No way, no how, whatever. And they wound up selling them all. And at the end they were all 5 million a piece. They were like, you know, they start, they got up to two and change and then three. And then they started with the special editions and that car captivated all of the rich buyers in the world. Apparently it worked. Yes, and for these types of people, the money was sort of irrelevant. I remember reading some absurd statistic, like the average Veyron owner owned some like quantity number of airplanes, including like a jet. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say the, some number of cars. Oh and yeah, it, some number of cars like too. Like, it was something. dozens, of, like yeah. more, more than a dozen cars. Yeah. But also, they owned like a set, more than one airplane as well. <laughs> the average Veyron buyer. Well, that's only appropriate because ha- some of the stuff on that car was aerospace stuff. Yes, like Undoubtedly. the. Yeah, I know you would know when you recognize this stuff, but the, the wing, for example, the actuators for wing, straight out of airspace. 
Um, and they were working on, when they did the 1200 horsepower car, they were working on trying to increase the thermal capacity of the braking system, even though it was sufficient for one full ABS stop from 264 miles an hour to zero. Um, and they wanted to do even better. And they were looking at calipers that were made out of something off of a jet, like some, some very hot part of a jet. Like, it's insane. The car's nuts. I mean, that certainly makes sense when you think about how much an airplane weighs, which is hundreds of thousands of pounds, and the fact that the brakes are, like, bigger than a car brake, but still, like, you look at it, and you're like, oh, it's, like, still, like, the size of a person compared to a whole airplane. Like, it's incredible yeah. what the brakes of an airplane can do. That's true. Yeah. Although, I mean, here's the, the joke of, of the matter is, Veyron goes, like, I love this stat. Veyron goes 100 miles an hour faster, the Supersport, 100 miles an hour faster then a 787 Dreamliner goes at takeoff. Now, takeoff yes. speed isn't the, you know, isn't the be-all and end-all. But yeah, well, it is also faster than the fastest helicopter in the world. The Veyron is, yeah. Yes, which I um, think is another interesting statistic yeah. to put that in perspective. It's, uh, that I mean, car. and the whole thing is, I mean, it's, so, it's on the one hand so pointless that you have to have the sec- second key. But I love that theater that you have the second key and then yes. there's like this hidden key thing. Um, and you can't turn the wheel and whatever, but they did it for safety. Um, yes. And I love, it was so un-German of them to come up with theater, like, mm-hmm. yeah, we do a second key and then top speed mode, it lowers it, does this, whatever. I just thought... It's because it's like they're, they have ostensibly French heritage for that company, so they can like sort of secretly let their hair down and pretend yeah. to be slightly less German for a few minutes. You know what, they speaking of French and, and nationalities, the, the feedback that I got from one of our coworkers, who's Italian, was immediately when he saw the video, it's not a Tory, it's Ettore. And I'm like, okay, yes, I'm sure it is. But if I'm like, and this car was made by Ettore Bogatti, every people are like, did you sneeze? Are you having a stroke? Can you smile? Do you smell toast? Like, it's just, <laughs> I can't do that. I mean, it was bad enough that I have to say piech. I mean, that's an unpronounceable word for, for most people in the world, but I can't call them piech. So. Yes, apparently the Austrian way is slightly different. Um, I think one of the other things about that car to note, or that I noted when I, in, in when I experienced the car, is the, the fact that that car goes, you know, 268 miles an hour, and then there's plenty of sort of normal cars that you can buy that go 200 or 210 miles an hour, comparatively normal. You yeah. know, like a, well, a Hellcat, what does that do, 190 miles an hour or something like that, and like yeah. a, a, an F12 or a Lusso, all of these things that seat yeah. four people and have luggage space, and you can put like 100 pounds of dog food in the trunk and all that. And so the difference between only 210 miles an hour and 270 miles an hour is a huge difference in, in, in the car itself. Like, because there's space for a briefcase in the trunk of the Veyron. Like, it does have there's, a trunk, but yeah. it will hold a briefcase. It but won't hold a duffel a, bag. <laughs> that's true. I mean, the, the trunk is tiny. But there's also a time component. That Veyron's 15 years old, which is horrifying to me because it seems like yesterday, but like in Pennsylvania, that classifies for classic car plates. Like... <laughs> That it's an old car now. And there's been 15 years of progress. At the time when the Veyron came out, which, you know, 1,000 horsepower was double the next biggest thing, basically. I mean, there was effectively nothing over. Yeah. Like, I mean, let's know, see, what, what else could you be buying? E60 like, M5. Had 500 horsepower. horsepower. The Ferrari 599 was not quite out yet. Right. I guess it was not still 575, enough. which was around 500 horsepower. Right. So, the, uh, I mean, it was effectively Marcella go. Double. Mercilago was what six hundred, yeah, or something, or a little um, under six hundred. But now seven eight, you know, six seven and eight hundred horsepower is kind of common. So I mean, yeah, you I look at like a that. Senna, which is or, or like a seven hundred horsepower Ferrari is out of the box. Seven or eight hundred horsepower Ferrari is out of the box, like the uh, the eight twelve and the right. Pista, right? Yeah. So I just think you know, like first of all, the world has moved on. We don't need eight liters and sixteen cylinders to get a thousand horsepower anymore. Um, you know, the original one was port injected, um, and now that's, uh, and there's 1200 was port injected, but then the Chiron is now direct injected. So now it gets 1500 horsepower out of that same basic engine. Um, mm-hmm. and I have not yet d- driven a Chiron, which I need, which is a problem that I need to correct. Is that um, a problem? It's a problem because I actually, to, to do this just out of sheer luck. And, um, I'm, I think the only journalist in the world to have ever driven all four variants of the Veyron. Um, hmm. And I drove them pretty early on. Um, and so like when Chiron came out, like I was like, oh my God, this is the fifth Veyron basically, you know, um, but didn't work. 
Um, not yet. I will get to drive it. But I'm sure that, that car is a quantum leap forward once again. I mean, the, the thousand horsepower car drove like an Audi and Piesh worked at Audi. I mean, let's, let's, we need to do an episode on this man. We've I mean, said this many times. And we keep not doing it because we have to do the research that right, is required to do that. And I think a lot of the research doesn't exist in English. So you're going to have to do the research. I can do it. It's, just, it's, it's a lot of work. But it, let me tell you, like in the two seconds that I went, took to go back through my notes to write that episode. I mean, I love that the, the, guy, the guy was at Audi and he was like, hmm, yeah, we should probably invent all wheel drive for cars. So he, oh, no, I'm yes. sorry. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I got that totally wrong. He was at Porsche. And did the 917, yes, which kicked the shit out of everything and single-handedly ruined Can-Am, I mean, and every other form of racing, because mm-hmm. it was just world-dominating. And then... Uh, let, well, yes. And the, the thing about, well, I think Can-Am is super cool because, I mean, I know you're not into racing. I'm not that into racing either. But Can-Am is one of the very few times that things have been fully unrestricted yeah. uh, in racing. And that's why Can-Am cars of the early 70s are so like legendary and insane is because they were like, let's take a flat 12 and then put turbos on it and give Do it 1,100 horsepower yep. and go around like Laguna Seca used to have this, the, there's this whole infield section of Laguna Seca that used to not exist because there was just a straight from, did you know this? From turn yeah. one all the way up to where turn five is was a straight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and With you the didn't go, that killed yeah, and you, and you <laughs> didn't go into under the bridge, the tire bridge. Uh, and so it was a very fast track, and these cars were unrestricted, and so they were like, yes, let's go 240 miles an hour in the early 70s uh, in these cars. But anyway, yes, so he did that, and then he did the whole Quattro thing. Uh, well, so yeah, so he did Porsche. He did 917, and he, you know, sort of world domination. Left. Porsche's first Le Mans win. I, right, yeah. So he leaves. I love this. He starts a small independent engineering company, and invents the five-cylinder Mercedes diesel engine that we love mm-hmm. in his spare time. And then goes to work to Audi and he was like, yeah, I kind of like that five-cylinder. So let's make a gas version out of it. Oh, and also let's put all-wheel drive in cars, which is just something that had never been done. I mean, he is the granddaddy of like everything mm-hmm. amazing. 1966. Wow. Okay. You know what I mean. Jensen but in a sporting Interceptor way. Yes. FF. Which also had you know, ABS. That was an incredibly advanced car. Yes, but, you know how many cycles per second the ABS was on the Jensen Interceptor? I love this. No, I must. Is it two? Four. Oh, <gasps> that fast? Four cycles per second was how fast it could lock and unlock the brakes, the ABS system in that. That's the really FF. quick. That's <laughs> yeah, that but dumb what is it now? system. Oh, they're 20, 30, 50, 100. But they're, I mean, first gen ABS on like a, on a Chrysler Voyager, which had a single channel for the rear brakes, don't ask me how I know this, was one hertz. It could mm-hmm. lock and unlock. Erk, erk. Bert, no, two hertz. Sorry. But anyway, um, that was Dunlop's system called Max Arrête, which I loved, mm. wasn't it? Anyway. Yes, Max Stop. Yeah, Max Stop. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, he put Quattro in, in you know, rally cars and ruined that for everything else, too. I mean, the motherfucker was just, just always pushing engineering-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really respect him for that. So we need to do an episode on him. But um, they, I mean, they just got the whole recipe completely right. From start to finish. It was like... So here's the one thing. The recipe the engine, for which? For that Veyron. The first Sorry, Veyron. For the, for the first Veyron. So they... What do you mean by that? Well, hold on. I'm going to say. So his, you know, his targets were over 406. So I can't find this anywhere. But the engineers told me back in the day that the 917s were clocked at... In 1971, were clocked at 406 kilometers an hour. And that is why PS told them they had to beat 406, which is why they had to get to 407. Um, so he didn't say it was about the French? No. Who well, no, no, no. That the, so the engineers told me that the 917 had the record. I couldn't find it. So then I, I found that that was like in 1971 or whatever. The record definitely went to the French with this Peugeot, crazy Peugeot thing that hit 407. So this could be Le Mans. Uh, you're talking about Le Mans specifically or just outright Le, record? Le because Mans. The, the car could have theoretically gone faster. Yes. The, the 917 could have gone faster. And Somewhere I think else. that the Can-Am ones did go faster because the 917, the closed cars, which ran at Le Mans, which didn't have turbochargers, I'm sure were slower than the, the 917.10 and 917.30, which are the Can-Am cars. That could be 1100 that horsepower. Could be so interesting. So I, I found that the, the ultimate record, this is an interesting one about Peugeot. They... They got the record at 407 and then published it at 405 because the oh, 405, 405 was just coming out. Yeah. Um, so you see so all then, these like 
cool period-like Art Deco looking drawings of this outrageous thing and they're calling it 405 for the 405 and whatever. But um, in the middle of like production and post-production of that Veyron episode, Bugatti puts a press release out and says, the original Veyron had to go faster than 406 because that was how fast the 917s went. So I couldn't find it anywhere, but they repeated their own thing that they never really talked about back in the day. They always said it was like this arbitrary 400 number, but actually I love that it was Piège wanted his fucking record back. Like he was like, I, I sorry, the French beat yeah. me. I want it back. Um, so he got like, he got that recipe right. And they got this whole idea that all Bugattis for, of all time were always incredible pieces of art. And if you look at early stuff, they like real Bugattis, they were, I mean, the engine block is the most beautiful yes, thing you've ever it's seen. turned aluminum on machining on the side oh. of the block. Like yep. those cars were incredibly sophisticated. Some of them had three valves per cylinder, dual overhead cam, like gear driven valve train, supercharged, oh, yeah. like a one and a half liter straight eight. Like those cars are epically like. Epic. And if you've ever like seen an, one of those engines taken apart, oh my God, jewelry. every piece. Jewelry. It looks like jewelry. jewelry. Yep. Everything and, inside, which no one yep. will ever see. Well, I don't know. Maybe the expectation was that the motors would be disassembled with some yeah. regularity, which was but true. But it was just then. cost no object. It was just cost yeah. no Like, and uh, Tori Bugatti was nuts. I mean, like, he just, he didn't care how much money, like, the famous thing is he built a car for the kings, and then no king was good enough to have one, so he didn't sell any. Like, he was just such a prick, and in, like, in a great way, to be honest, like, he was just a lover of all things aesthetic and yes. engineering. And the and cars show nothing. that. The cars yeah. really show that. Yeah. It is really a special experience to interact with one of those cars. Yeah. And the, the, you know, the Grand Prix cars are really cool. The, the Royale is well known for the, the engine was supposed to go in a train and then they were like, oh, we'll just put it in a car and it'll be 11 liters or 12 liters straight eight. So cool. Like we'll make seven of them. The car was called the Royale because it was supposed to be sold to royalty. And they this is the one like, that no royalty was ever eligible it, to buy, yeah, right? Yeah. So they made six of them and then there was like a seventh car that they made that didn't have headlights because it was never going to be driven at night and so it looked sort of funny but there's a lot of weird stuff like that the type 57s are great also oh God, they're beautiful um they are really a it's another one of those pre-war cars that when you drive it you're like wow this feels like quite a bit newer and more sophisticated than most pre-war cars uh, although I will say that it has to be a, a later car with hydraulic brakes because if you drive one that doesn't have hydraulic brakes then you'll be like oh this does not feel modern at all so the only early Bugatti I've ever driven was a, uh, a Type 51, Peter Mullins' car, who's mm -hmm. a huge Bugatti collector, and it was 1931? That's right. I have it written down. Um, I have pictures of the drive all through, and it had, it had cable actuated brakes, um, and one of the little pulleys popped off while we were driving down a hill. Uh, that was a very, very frightening moment. That thing yes. was seriously fast. Like yeah, supercharged it's, straight it's, like no joke fast. And wonderful, wonderful noises too. God, oh, yeah. they just sound fantastic. And you're just covered in oil because it's flow through and it literally drips into the passenger compartment. So I ruined two pairs of did, shoes. Did yours have a fuel pump? Because a lot of those early cars don't have fuel pumps. Uh, there's, a, there's a plunger that comes out of the dashboard in front of the passenger and you have to... You have to pump it to, to pressurize the fuel tank. You pressurize the whole fuel tank, and, and so when the car starts to like sputter, then you have to pump it yeah. back up to reestablish fuel pressure or air pressure inside the fuel tank. It, uh, I, I, mean, I drove that thing quite a bit. They were like, you have to be on your A-game the whole time. You stop paying attention for a split second, and you're dead. I mean, but they can keep up with, like, I drove one across the Golden Gate Bridge, which was insane. And you can keep up with the modern traffic easy. It probably does 0 to 60 in like six seconds. Um, stopping? No. Turning? No. Bumps? Forget it. Like, <laughs> yes. It was, they were, but they were incredible pieces. Well, and of sort jewelry. of light, delicate experience compared mm -hmm. to like the Bentleys of the same era. I mean, Ettore famously said that Bentleys were the world's fastest lorries, which is uh, co uh, Commonwealth English for semi. Um, but he called them Bentley's trucks, basically, which they, they were, comparatively are. I mean, they're really they're fire robust, trucks. which is what you needed them to do to, in order to survive 24 hours of racing. I mean, there's a reason why Bentley was winning them all before Bugatti was, like, in the early, late 20s and early 30s was because they were, I mean, you just, had, in order to win, you had to survive, which was kind of the issue in the But so, that's so funny that, you know, the, like, back in the day, the, the Atore was like, you know, oh, the Bentleys are big and fat and heavy. And then when the Veyron came out, everyone bitched that it was 44,060 yes. pounds. And that was, here's the thing about that. 
Yes, 4,000 pounds was heavy 15 years ago. Not anymore, but it was heavy 15 years ago. The, the whole tub of the car plus the rear bolt-on structure, so everything except for the body panels, was 298 pounds. Yeah, so the rest car. of the weight is motor and transmission and radiators. <laughs> right, and the, so the motor is 1,100 pounds. The seven-speed dual clutch is another 300. So you have a 1,400-pound engine and transmission, and that's not counting diffs and, and axles and brakes and all the other sh- and the wheels. I mean, the t- like all this all just of which have to be up to 250 miles an hour. Oh yeah, they all have to withstand whatever 250 mile an hour car can throw at it. Right. So I just say, like, right off the bat, I just take out 1,400 pounds from 4,000, and you're at a 2,600 pound car. I don't think that that's all that unimpressive given what the car could do. Um, but it was, you know, there was a, at that point, you know, sports cars were 2,800 pounds, 3,000. Well, now they're 3,800 pounds, 3,600 pounds. You know, I'm sure a 911 Turbo S at this point is, which is a very light car, is probably nearing 3,500. Yeah, um, that's sort of my estimate too, because the GT3 is like 3,000 and it doesn't have four-wheel drive and it doesn't have turbochargers right, and intercoolers, intercoolers and, yeah. and back seats. and. Yep. So, and here's the, the other thing. So I, I talked in the, in the video about Loris. Uh, Loris Bicocchi is an um, Italian tuner. And he, so back in the day, he worked for... Tuner, um, like an uh, engineer tuner. Engi- not, yes, like, sorry, not, like, tuner. not like Abt or... Yeah, Ruf. not like uh, Newspeed or, you know, uh, any of the other APR. But no, no, he worked with car companies to tune the chassis so the cars would, would drive well. Um, and he did the original Veyron. Um, and the original Veyron was very much an Audi. I mean, it, it was very, very good and just boring. I mean, and that was part of the criticism was that, like, you know, other than it, they ride really stiff. Other than that, you yes. have no idea. What that was the, the first thing I noticed with. about that car is how hard it rides. Did you drive a regular Veyron? No, I didn't. Okay. Just the Super So Sport. the regular Veyron drives like it has sand in its dampers compared to the Super Sport. The hmm. Super Sport drives is much less... It's not that it rides so... It's not that the suspension itself is so stiff. The sidewalls of the tires are so Mm. incredibly stiff so that they can withstand 250-something miles an hour um, that it's like riding on, like, you know, 19-inch wheels with 10-series tires. Bang, boom, bam, over everything. And they smooth it out a lot on the Super Sport. Um, But for that, for the 1,200-horsepower cars, they sort of, like, apparently, what I gleaned from, like, if you read... A lot of these engineers and a lot of the chassis guys never want to talk because they don't want to piss off their employer. But now um, that Piech is dead. Well, it's not even that. It's not that even Piech. So I know that Loris encountered a lot of resistance internally. Um, who is this Italian? Why is he here? Why can't we tune the car and whatever? And this, this is a German thing. This is a Volkswagen Group project. Um, and there were a lot of people standing in his way when he was tuning the original Veyron. The Supersport... They earned his respect. Um, he earned their respect. I'm sorry. Yes, he had earned their respect by the time he started in the Super Sport. And they let, him, they let him do his thing. And the cars are night and day. I mean, the, the Super Sport has genuinely really good steering feel, which was completely absent in the, in the 1,000 horsepower cars. Um, and so I talked about in the video. Like, I had him in the passenger seat. I didn't know him. I mean, I knew who he was. I said Why'd hi. Why'd they send him out with you? They always send out. Uh, you never drive a Veyron alone. Uh, I know, but why did they send him with you? I lucked out. There were two guys. It was him and someone else. I don't know. Um, the, the Bugatti press launches are very small affairs. Like, there's, you know, there's not a lot of people there. I think uh, this one was in Spain, and I think there were probably four journalists to drive the cars, and that was it. And that was all that was going to be driving it in the world. And uh, so I got Loris. He gets in the car. I say hi to him. And, um, and I... I immediately, I mean, I was like, immediately, like, wow, this feels very different. I had just driven a regular Veyron, like, a month earlier. Um, and then I pull out, and I sort of get on the gas, and I'm like, hmm, a lot of lag. So the 1,200 horsepower cars have a huge amount of lag compared to the 1,000. Hmm. Uh, they have bigger turbos. And I said, yeah, a lot of lag, and he kind of shakes his head, like, mm, you know, and typically these guys are paid by the manufacturer. They don't want to say anything bad. And anytime you say anything bad, they're like, yeah, but, and they come around with some marketing bullshit. So I just immediately dismiss like any of the company people right off the bat. And I was expecting to be like, yes, but it's, you know, whatever, some excuse. He said nothing. And like right, right away there was an on-ramp and I flung the car into the on-ramp and I was like, holy shit, this doesn't feel anything like a Veyron. And he was like, what? And I'm like, this feels like a fucking Lotus. 
And I said in the video that he started crying. His eyes welled up with tears. And he was like, thank you. Thank you. And I was like, from what? Like, and he was like, no one's noticed. And he had put years, two and a half years of work into tuning this car to get the car to feel lightweight and nimble and fun. And he did it. Totally did it. But that was the problem that no one else drove the 1,000 horsepower cars and then drove the 1,200 horsepower car first. So, you know, he knew the difference between the two, but none of the other journalists picked up on it because they hadn't driven it. And I, it's not, I can't blame them. It's just, you know, it's a scarcity issue. Um, uh, but wow, that car drove so differently and it was not this isolation chamber. And then I jumped it. And there were a bunch of other things that I shouldn't have done. But it was his fault. He was talking and he was like, yeah, yeah, go, go, go. And there was these two roads that looked the same and one had a bunch of heaves on it and one didn't. And he thought we were on the other road. And so we were at 302, I think, 302 or 304 was kilometers an hour was the fastest I saw right before. He was like, shit, shit, brakes. <laughs> it was too late. Just airborne, airborne, airborne. Boom. Landed fine. No problem. Um, never want to do that again. Um, but anyway, you drove the Veyron Super Sport. Mm -hmm. What'd you mm -hmm. think? Uh, I mean, it, like I said, awesome in the like dictionary sense of the word awesome, uh, which is like awe inspiring as opposed to awesome. Like, like uh, you maybe haven't heard of Eddie Izzard. He does this thing about how the word uh, Americans misuse the word awesome. They're like, oh, this hot dog's awesome. And they're like, no, it's not. Like being on the moon is awesome. It's not this inspiring hot dog is not awesome. awe. Yeah. So the car is awesome in that sense. Like it is truly just extraordinary how it can do so much farther beyond what any other car can do and make it feel sort of relatively effortless. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed is like you, you like go really fast for a minute and then you like slow down and you're going like 85 miles an hour at that point and you're like, I think I could get out and walk at this point. Mm -hmm. Like the car just gives this, this sensation of like velocitization or, or whatever, which is this idea that like this is a thing that like apply like if you're on a big empty open road and you're going 90 miles an hour this happens like going on highway five or something a big flat open road without a lot of vantage points you get sort of velocitized which is you get desensitized mm -hmm. and if with all the other traffic's going fast uh the car kind of does that to you where then you return to some normal speed and you're like I, this feels like nothing it's totally un underwhelming because the car is so competent and able to like take whatever, you know, make, make it really uneventful to go fast that it, uh, I mean, that's kind of the goal of a car like that. You don't want it to be really lively at a hundred miles an hour because if you're going two and a half times that speed, then the car will be unmanageable. Right. Uh, so, I mean, that was incredible. The, the forces that it generates, accelerative forces obviously are wild. And I think like as much as I'm like not an enthusiast of that genre of car, uh, I will say that having grown up like reading about it and everyone sort of freaking out about it, I, it was an, a really special experience to ex experience it in, in person for the first time. And I, this happens to me a lot with cars where I'm like, oh, I don't like these things. And then like you experience one in person, you're like, oh, it's actually pretty neat. Uh, the question is, I mean, that's, that's a first impression. The question is, if you drive it enough, whether that fades or whether it's like immediate in, or like infatuation versus like, oh, I could get married to this experience. And that's the, the question. Good question. I don't, and, and to be honest, I don't know the answer. I mean, the, the only example that I can give is there is a, the guy that I met at a Cars and Coffee and he showed up in a Chiron and he mm -hmm. is probably, I think he's 81 or 83 years old. Um, in great shape, popped out of the car like it was nothing. And they're tough to get in and out of. They're, you know, like almost Lotus Elise sort yeah. of. Big, levels of like, wide sill, right. s high center console. And just the seat, the distance from the seat to the front of the door is not very great, so you really have to tuck in your knees. Um, so I was kind of impressed, you know, that he got out of the car, and we started talking, um, and he had a 918 um, and a LaFerrari and a McLaren P1 all at the same time, as one does. And he, the Chiron came out and he was like, well, or, you know, and he, what he told me, which is like unbelievable to me, is that he's like, I couldn't decide which one. So my wife was like, get all three. Like, OK. So he had all three and he said he liked them for different reasons and he drove all of them sort of equally. Um, and then he test drove a Chiron and sold all three cars um, and daily. So he's got a smart ED, a smart <laughs> electric drive, um, electric smart and his Chiron. And when I met him, he had the Chiron for like six months, had 6,000 miles on it, showed me pictures of it on track. Like what a hero. My hero, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but I, you know, and asked him what, so why'd you get rid of the other cars? And he was like, this does everything better than all of them, including being fun. And I thought, okay. I mean, if you can out a McLaren P1, I guess it's got to be even better than a Veyron Supersport, uh, the 12 mm. horsepower Veyrons. Um, wow. And that's the thing is, so you, you have a, a, a gentleman who's clearly of whatever means <laughs> imaginable. He decides no point in having these other three because the Chiron's that good and I think that speaks to the longevity you know of this I don't think these these are type of types of cars that people have a thrill in and then get rid of Hmm. I have a feeling they keep them and use them and take long trips and and you know that kind of stuff with I don't know yeah I mean that's his experience I guess the question is well like philosophically what kind of car person are you like do you want to go fast and have something competent or do you want to like mess around and at low speed, I mean, I mean... Could you really have a collection of 100 cars and not have a Bugatti in it? Uh, me, personally? Yeah, even, even you or I. Like, it's not my kind of car either. It's an automatic and whatever If else. I had 100 cars, I would be more likely to have a Type 57, for sure, than a Chiron okay. or a Veyron. Fair enough. Personally. Fair enough. I, but I could see, I see a place. I see a place for that. I mean, look... Obviously, the car that I want is a McLaren F1. Having never driven one or even sat in one, that's the one I want because it's manual. And, you know, what I love about the McLaren F1 is that Gordon Murray didn't set out to make the fastest car in the world. He wanted to make the best sports car. And it wasn't yeah. a supercar and it wasn't a hypercar. It was like, I just want to make the best sports car ever made. And it wound up being really fast. And it took the Veyron 20, 17 years, whatever it was, to de- dethrone that car. Um, and that car's, the Veyron's mission was just top speed. And uh, I found a great interview with Gordon Murray, and he called the Veyron the most pointless exercise on the planet. Um, and he never drove one. He never drove the 1,000-horsepower car. And then he drove a 1,200-horsepower car, um, and he stopped complaining publicly and said in the interview that it, he was very impressed with it, and he said a bunch of nice things about it. Hmm. Um, it's a really good car. So I can see, yes, if you don't want... Or can't afford a McLaren. Let's be honest. What's a McLaren F1 at this point? Thirty-five million dollars. Mm, Thirty I million. Twenty. Twenty-five. I mean, at this point, you could say nine hundred. <laughs> you could say one billion dollars. I mean, it's just it's Doctor Evil territory. Well beyond. Yeah. Um, sorry, I have to do the. I haven't done Doctor Evil in a while. Um, but you know, and, and a Veyron is cheap by comparison. You could have 10 Veyrons for one, for one McLaren F1. So, I mean, that's the I, that's thing I would I always I bump see. up against. is like a, a couple million dollars is a lot of money. To, like you could have a lot of interesting, cool cars. You could have yeah. all of the interesting, cool yeah. cars. For, but, you know, if no, cost is no object, you know. Like I can't imagine by, driving a car like a Veyron where, you, you know, once you get like $25,000 buys you a set of tires and then... Every other set, you have to send the car, <laughs> like freight the car back to Molsheim um, for them to replace the wheels. And yeah, it's I think it was every four sets, but no, no matter. Yes, the wheels only last some number of tires, which yeah. is absurd. But these like, are the kind of things you have to do in order to get a 270 mile an hour car. I guess. I guess. I mean, that's, that's the crazy thing. I mean, it's, it stands to reason. You buy a Ferrari, you know, the Ferrari parts are going to cost you more than the Volkswagen that you bought or the Toyota that you bought. So mm-hmm. it only stands to reason that the most expensive car in the world, or what was the most expensive car in the world, would have the most ma- expensive maintenance. But mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Um, plus, I don't yes. like that you can't... Well, that's the thing. You need to be... Like, this is what we were talking about earlier, is the types of people who, what, like, the other things that they owned was, like, in the dozens of cars and that they also owned airplanes. Like, they, for these kinds of people, I mean, compared to a jet, it's inexpensive to maintain... <laughs> Like, we always complain about how expensive cars are to keep, especially cars of this genre, but you look at, like, the cost of keeping an airplane, and so these people are like, eh, whatever, whatever cost right. is, is, like, you, that's matter. like, uh, David E. Davis, who I know you, like, think was an asshole, I don't know anything about whether he was an asshole or not, um, but he has this great quote where he talks about, um, in, this, in the 60 Minutes video about the Lamborghini Countach, where he said, they're like, oh, it's kind of a lot of money, the interviewer, 60 Minutes interviewer says to David E. Davis, and he says, it was kind of like pheasant shooting, like whatever it costs, it's worth it. You, if you want to do it, then you have to pay whatever it costs. And, like, this is that's why he's an target, asshole. Target <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of like pheasant shooting. Who says that? Especially a guy who grew up, there's like white trash from the middle of 
Michigan. Like, it's like pheasant shooting. Bring me a cigar. I, yeah, that's why I think he, I always thought he was a pompous asshole. But he's right. I, I mean, love the way he talks about it. cars. I think he's like, he, I love, like, just he just gets cars in a way that is really um, resonates with me. Uh, which is to say, and like to talk about the, the Bugatti, which is to say that for the people who can afford it, whatever it costs, it gives you this experience you can't get anywhere else. Sure. Uh, and sure. so it's worth it. Uh, and you kind of just have to pay to play. And this, exi- this exists everywhere. I mean, that happens with Ferraris too. People are like, oh my goodness, it's $10,000 to do a belt service every five years. And you're like, yeah, but I don't know. It's a Testarossa. Look at it. Right. That's, well, that's also, what you, you have know, to deal $10, with. $10,000 every three. Look at that car every day. And, yeah. And ten thousand dollars every three years is what your BMW three series depreciates, you know. At, so shut up. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. Depreciation is gnarly. It is. I'd rather <laughs> spend it on belt services, well, or actually, even better, I'd rather just buy a belt for seventy eight dollars and do it myself, and then not have to deal with depreciation either. But yeah, that's we have to pull I'm the motor out. <laughs> not in my Ferrari. That's correct. That's why you don't own a Testarossa. I would totally own a Testarossa. I want to look at that thing. I just don't want to pull a 12-cylinder out every five years to do it. You don't actually have to do a timing belt every five years. But that's, that's also uh, true. That's also true. Uh, yeah, but you think about the consequences of, of breaking timing belts is so scary for interference motors, especially ones with like fl- horizontally opposed 12-cylinders that cost as much as they do. Like, it's, it, the other thing is it's, it, cars are basically unsaleable if they're due for a belt service. Not right. unsaleable, but it's, it makes a big difference to value. And I think the speed with which cars sell, these cars are like houses. People want something they can use. They, want, they don't want something that they have to spend money on immediately. Well, uh, look, my so, car, if I ever sold it, would get a belt service the day before it was sold. I yes. mean, but I'm not going to do it you know, when I can see the belt and you can inspect it and you look and it's fine. Yes, um, totally. Why would, you, why would you waste your money? God, I hope I don't live to regret saying that. But I, mean, <laughs> I hear your timing belt breaking right now. I'm, gonna go, I'm just going to go tow the car home and swap the belt. Now, I mean, look, it's cheap insurance, but let's be honest, shit can go wrong when you're doing a belt anyway. So it's not like, you know, it's I, I've seen belts break new. I've seen belts last, you know, 30 years. So whatever. Um, but neither of us are in a position to buy a Testarossa, unfortunately. Or a Can we split one? Can we split a Testarossa? Uh, I don't think I want one badly enough to do that. I just want to look at one. Can you just... Can I have someone park one on the... Buy a model. I don't... I don't... I I mean, we've we've discussed maybe doing an episode about the Testarossa and the driving experience. I don't dislike driving them, but I don't think I get enough visceral thrill out of driving a Testarossa to want one, to want to own one. No. And that's it. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Cool. The, the, um, l- the later variants, the 512 TR and M, are better uh, driving cars. I'll have, more to, I'll have to do some research. Maybe I'll do another, uh, the next Spotlight or one of the next Spotlights on, uh, on the Testarossa. I'll go drive a bunch of them. Yeah, I've got to dig up some late cars. Actually, I know of one, so... Okay, well, send me his number and I'm going to go <laughs> get to <work. laughs> ring Ring his doorbell. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> Hyphen sent me, and I would like to drive your Testarossa. And he'll be like, spray me, spray a, me in the face with, with Lysol. It's a 512M. You'll be like, thank you. I needed that. Yeah. Um, uh, just spray it right in. It, it, you know, it keeps people alive, don't you know? Oh, goodness. We don't want to be responsible <laughs> for, people's, for people's well-being in that way. No. <clears throat> um, I think you can spray Banaka in your... <laughs> remember Banaka? Oh, my God. Yeah. That's... And anything more than that is probably pretty dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, okay. I'm going to um, get back to the drawing board to go do the next Spotlight episode. It's a formula that seems to work, despite the fact that the car doesn't go anywhere and you don't go anywhere in it. I mean, I, you made it interesting because you contextualized it. And I think, like, considering, just to, so, like, I guess watchers know, there's an, more than an order of magnitude difference between, like, the Spotlight where the car just sits there and you sort of talk about it and you insert like interesting pictures and stuff versus like when we're out at the track, you know, with a full crew that then that's, you know, it, it's I more mean, than an order of magnitude difference. In cost, you mean, yeah. In, to, to make in those complexity. videos. Oh, yeah. yes. And look, we can't do icons right now. <clears throat> I could not, I mean, even if it were legal to do it, I don't think it's really appropriate for us to be out renting a racetrack, you know, with, you know, in cars with the crew and whatever. It's just not the right time. So in lieu of our ability to do icons, 
um, I came up with this idea that Spotlight is something we can be doing. It's an empty warehouse with me plus one other person. Um, I did I did not drive that Veyron, um, but I d- inserted footage that I had from other stuff. The next two cars I did go out and drive and just got just cursory footage of it because I just think it's kind of cool for people to hear what these cars sound like. Um, and so the next two are done. And from the, this point on, I'd like to just go out and do a quickie drive in each one of the cars so we can cover that. Just, you know, and the sort of, honestly, Petrolicious did that really great uh, early on where they would just give you 30 seconds of just getting to listen to a car being brutalized on a back road. Yes. Um, uh, yes. And I kind of like that. So I want to insert those. I did insert those in, in the next two that we've already shot. Um, and uh, I, of course, asked the YouTube audience what cars we should cover, and everyone's saying my Volkswagen. So. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> there was a lot of interesting suggestions in there. There was yeah. one that was really comedic. I forget what it was. Something absurd. It was like the Reliant K or something like terrible like that. I forget what Why it was. Not? I'm sure there's a great story behind it. I mean, I don't know if I want to read Anything with Lee Iacocca. Get... Yeah. Uh, who's an interesting dude. So, yeah. And you can talk about Ricardo Montalban. Fine uh, Corinthian leather. Rich Corinthian leather, Rich yes. Leather, yes. Everyone asks, Corinthian leather. Which is from Corinth, New York, I believe, which is a shithole in upstate. <laughs> no, like, so there's a Letterman there. thing where they're interviewing him, and he's like, and Dave Letterman's like, what is Corinthian leather? Now, now, Paul mentioned this earlier. What, what is the deal? What the hell is? Is there anything really Corinthian leather? Is that anything? It's it just... <laughs> it's just, it, it's some kind of vinyl they make in Detroit, isn't it? <laughs> no, they found, they found a leather that was very pliable, very soft, and very durable. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I don't know whether it was because of uh, the, the writer, Jim Nichols, who wrote the commercials for Chrysler for me at that time, found, he wanted to find a, a word that sounded sort of elegant, that mm-hmm. I could say with a little verb, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so, Corinthian. Oh, yeah. Seemed, you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 but but does it mean uh, anything? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's completely made up. Uh, okay, um, I as guess we... you know, many marketing terms are. Yes, we have to include a link to Ricardo Montalban. Talking You're going to have to find this one. Either. This is Got another it. little insider thing. The worst part about doing this episode is, as we're talking, we're always thinking, "Oh fuck! I just mentioned whatever car. Now I have to go find an image of that or a video clip of that." And it's just doing this, like creating all of these inserts and finding them for our editor is the worst part of these episodes. So if one day we do an episode where we never talk about any specific car, it's because you know we don't want to have to go after find the photo. seven hours finding photos. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So don't forget to click on the like and subscribe and the notification bell buttons. Um, yeah, so you can watch more spotlights when they come out because I think that's a, it's a, they're pretty compelling content for the type of content that it's legal to create right now. I thank you for those kind words, Derek Tim Hyphen Scott. Okay, and, now uh, I have to, to balance them without some, some negative stuff, otherwise I won't be curmudgeon, curmudgeonly enough. I'm just kidding. Uh oh, I'm waiting. I, I don't want to look <laughs> at you anymore. I have to go. <laughs>